Okay, so um, as, as uh, Ruben mentioned, <coughs> I run, and I, I also before, I run the Conservation Behavior Research Lab in Ben Gurion University uh, of the Negev in Israel. Uh, this is, by the way, the view from our campus, more or less from our windows, uh, which the campus is, is in, a, in a village where I work and, and live, so it's pretty nice. And what is conservation behavior? In case you wondered, it's a scientific discipline aimed at taking animal behavior theories and methodologies and applying them to the conservation and management of species and habitats. Okay, so I don't work on a specific, it means that I don't, don't work on a specific system in my lab, but rather on any uh, case, any, any, um, any case where you have a conservation issue that has to do with behavior or that can have to do with behavior uh, and, and the species, species that students of mine work in my, in, in my lab uh, range from invertebrates like beetles and antlion to large mammals like ibex, hyenas, and everything in between, basically. Uh, so in this talk, there'll be two parts. The main part will be a brief overview of the role of animal cognition in conservation. And the second part uh, it will be more a specific empirical study of, on the behavioral responses of Nubian ibex to disturbances as a function of their tolerance to human. It's not directly connected to the first part. It does talk about cognition, about learning, habituation in this case. Uh, but you'll see, I'll, I'll give you that list of rules uh, in, a, in, in the first part. It won't be directly connected to them. But it's a cool system, and I have you know very very fresh results from like two days ago, which I was waiting for for a while. So I was excited and wanted to share them, uh, and I hope you enjoy. So the first part is based mostly on a paper that was published uh, last month in Annual Review of Ecology, Evolution, and Systematics, called like the talk, "The Rules of Attraction: The Necessary Role of Animal Cognition in Explaining Conservation Failures and Successes." And it was written with Alison Gregor and uh, Dan Blomstein. But before I go into animal cognition, I want to you know, talk about why, why, why behavior, what's, what's important about behavior and conservation. And, uh, and the reason why behavior can be, it doesn't, not in all cases, but can be really crucial and really important for conservation, is that whenever, if you take these cartoon species as an example, but whenever something changes in the environment, whether it's natural or uh, anthropogenic change, like this one, in almost all cases, the first response of the individuals in any species will be behavioral. Sp different species and different individuals will, will, might respond differently. Some will fly, some will hide, some will uh, freeze, some will not do anything, but still the first reaction will almost always be behavioral. Um, and not only that, it would usually have, you know, the, the way they respond will have a direct impact on their, um, uh, on the, whether they will survive or not the encounter or in general on, the, on how will they succeed later on. And this is true for any type of, uh, of disturbance. No. So this makes behavior very relevant if you want to try to understand how anthropogenic disturbances impact uh, uh, populations and also if you want to, to try to manage them. So the conservation behavior framework uh, basically outlines um, the linkages or the areas where behavior can be uh, relevant to conservation. I'm not going to go into that because that's not the topic here, but just to simplify it uh, and, and very generally, there are three main themes where behavior and conservation can uh, uh, be integrated. The first, we can use behavior to predict, as I said before, predict how animal populations will be affected by anthropogenic disturbances. We can use behavior to manage, to better manage our wildlife populations. And I think most of this talk will basically refer to that, how to manage, how to um, influence behavior in order to better uh, conserve species. And we can also use it to reveal changes to the, um, either to populations or ecosystems which are not necessarily quickly revealed by demographic changes. So in, in many ways, um, behavior is a leading indicators indicator, which means uh, the response is much quicker than the demographic response. And if we're in tune to that response, we can learn a lot about the ecosystem and the populations. Okay, so all of this is, you know, has to do with how to use behavior and conservation. 
But one key question is what drives animal behavior? And why do animals behave the way they do? Uh, why would this honey badger attack this uh, oryx? Why will this dog chase its tail? By the way, this is what comes, the, the pictures, what comes out when you Google crazy be animal behavior. So uh, these were the pic one of some of the pictures. Uh, and the idea is that if we want to understand how and why animals uh, behave the way they do, we, this is where we need to go to animal cognition. So what is that cognition? Animal cognition refers to the mechanisms by which animals acquire possess, store, and act on information from the environment. This includes perception, attention. Uh, attention is in brackets because it's not, it's not in the original quote. Uh, learning, memory, and decision-making. Okay. Now, this is important. Uh, this is really important conservation because a lot of conservation of species, especially when you're trying to, we're going to talk about behavior and conservation, when you're trying to manipulate or to influence animal behavior, so really the majority of, um, I would say, action that we're trying to, to, uh, uh, to implement are, it can be put on the attract repel continuum. We either, we either want to repel animals from areas which we think are good or, uh, or bad for them or bad for us, or to attract them to other areas. So when you talk about repel, again, you're trying to repel them from areas of con maybe potential conflict, areas which uh, are dangerous for them, areas where, where we don't want them to have to be, like cities, like garbage dump, like roads, like, you know, in case of birds, maybe wind turbines or wind farms, ecological traps, in this case, represented by uh, solar panels, invasive predator, invasive prey, all of that, we want to you know, make sure that animals don't interact with them and uh, uh, with these stimuli and, and, and go, go away, basically. We also want them to ignore other stimuli, for example, ecotourists. So we want to have tourism, but we want, don't want the tourism to negatively impact the animals. So if they, they will ignore the tourists, everything will be okay. And we want to attract them to other habitats, habitats we consider the high quality, uh, uh, overpasses over road, conservation corridors, et cetera, et cetera. So really a lot of what we're doing when we're doing, talking about species conservation is trying to either attract them or repel them from certain areas. However, if we don't understand what's the basis for their decision of what, why are they attracted to something, why they are repelled from, from other things, uh, we're doomed to fail or to repeatedly fail. And this is maybe why the conventional uh, ways, methods of repelling, for example, by guns and poison uh, are usually not effective. And the same goes for the conventional ways of attracting animals, which is usually the approach of build it and they would come. So we'll, you know, we'll make an overpass and you know, the animals should come. It's good for them, they should know, they should come. And of course, usually it doesn't work. And sometimes actually work the other way around. Uh, there's a nice review here of when good animals love bad restored habitat, how maladaptive habitat selection can constrain restoration. Basically talking about, you know, restoring habitat and creating ecological traps. So you are luring, you're actually successful maybe in luring the animals, but the, the, what we think is good habitat is actually bad for them. So to increase the success rate of conservation interventions, we need to understand why animals choose to approach or avoid certain stimuli. And this is where animal cognition comes in, in handy by considering how animals perceive stimuli, learn to properties, and consequently decide on whether to approach or avoid them, manager, manager will be able to design more efficient ways to attract or repel animals to improve conservation outcomes, which is, which is our goal in conservation. We want to, I mean, basically, what we want to do here is to improve conservation outcomes, but of course, just as in life, there are many ways to fail and only a few ways to succeed. And I'll give like a, a very a hypothetical example of, uh, of how, I mean, what do we need in order to try to reduce the probability of failure? So take this chicken, we want it to cross the road and reach this good habitat here, but, we want, but the road is dangerous. Uh, so we wanted to use you know, the overpass in order to reach this, this good high quality chicken heaven habitat. So there are various questions and I'll just go over them quickly and later on some of them will, will go more deeply. Uh, we have to ask ourselves if we want to, you know, to be better at succeeding in, you know, in, in attracting the chicken to the habitat and repelling it from the road. So if you consider the habitat, the good habitat, we want to attract it to the chicken too. So some, some questions we have to ask ourselves are, are there sufficient cues to alert the chicken to the habitat? Con specific cues or habitat cues. It's not enough just to build the habitat and wait for the animal to, you know, to get to, their, uh, uh, to it themselves. Does the chicken interpret these cues as representing a good habitat? 
which is a, a something which is completely uh, not um, not obvious. It doesn't have to be that way. If talking about the road, we want to repel the chicken from the road. So we should ask, is the road associated with, with attracting or repelling cues for the chicken? Has the chicken successfully crossed the road before? And th this is key, uh, past experience will determine future behavior. So we really need to know what is the past experience of the individual. Uh, does and can the chicken perceive the road as dangerous? If we're talking about the overpass, again, we want to attract the, the chicken to the overpass. So is the overpass perceivable? Is the chicken distracted by the road and unlikely to attend to the overpass? Reception, attention, these are all part of cognitive processes we need to, to have in mind. Does the overpass feel safe compared to its surroundings? Is there sufficient motivation for the chicken to leave its current patch? Has the chicken used the overpass before? Again, the role of experience. Are other chickens using the overpass? Social learning, which can be used as an accelerant. Deterrent, let's say we have a deterrent to, you know, to keep the chicken away from the road. So if we want it to work, we need to ask, is the deterrent perceivable and aversive? Is it sufficiently unpredictable to not result in habituation? Does it target evolutionary relevant fear stimuli? And does, does the chicken associate the deterrent <coughs> with the road? This is a key aspect that is being overlooked many times. We have deterrents. They are very successful in keeping the animals away from the deterrent, but no association is made with what you want to deter them from, let's say the road here. <clears throat> so basically you achieve nothing. And lastly, if we con uh, concentrate on the chicken, there are always, when to concentrate on the, the focal animal, there are two main questions. What is the evolutionary history of the chicken and what are the chicken's past experiences? Okay, so what did we did in the, in the article, in the, in the review, we, we listed, a, listed a list of rules uh, that, you know, that we need to consider uh, if we want to improve the success of conservation uh, actions, of attracting and repelling animals. Uh, this is by far not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are more, but this was the one that we found to be most important or most relevant. Uh, we, I group them into um, cognitive processes, so perception, attention, learning, etc. But you know, for you know, some rules can this can you know can be fitted into one more than one uh, process. And mostly, I, I wouldn't I go over them now briefly. I'll expand on three of them, but I won't expand of all, on all of them. I didn't want it to be like a lesson, and I wanted to you know to show some empirical data, so I only expand on three of them. Uh, and but feel free to ask me later about more rules or uh, either after the seminar or later on, you can always write me. Uh, so I'll just go over the list. So when we talk about perception and attention, one of the most important principles in general uh, in, in conservation, the Umwelt matters. If you're not sure what Umwelt is, um, in a few minutes I'll explain. And attention is finite. And we're talking about decision making, decisions are economic. So, uh, and not all cues are treated equally in making decisions. All of us, humans and animals, have cognitive biases. And we have to understand these cognitive biases in order to, you know, to manage and understand the behavior of animals because not always, the, the behavior will not always make sense. It might make sense in evolutionary, uh, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, that's how these biases were um, evolved. But uh, you know, if, we don't, if we're not aware of them, it will not make sense at all. So I will, I will expand later on the Umwelt. <clears throat> in terms of learning, learning is Bayesian, which means you come to like a novel environment with some kind of prior uh, no, a notion of what the environment is, and you update it. And they usually, uh, and, and what determines the, the prior will be your evolutionary history and your past experiences. Learning may be biased to focus on certain information, cognitive biases, as I mentioned before. The order of cues and experiences matters. Sensitive periods matter. Animals learn better at some periods and not at others. You have to be explicit about what you are teaching. Stimuli should be reinforced if we don't want learning to deteriorate. And social learning can be an accelerant. And I'll expand about the order of the cues and experiences and about being explicit about what you're teaching. And lastly, uh, the rule for memory, one the rule we chose. Animals are more likely to remember survival relevant information, which makes sense. Okay, I'll start with talking about the Umwelt a bit. And I'm not, I'm not sure how much you are familiar or not with, with the concept, but the, the term was, was coined by uh, von Uxel, which was a, a German biologist 
uh, zoologist uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, and basically what it means is that how we sense the world is not the same as how animals sense the world. And this is key in conservation because when we, in many cases, when we come to do conservation, we think as humans, you know, to, we look at the world through our, uh, our, our eyes, eyes. So, you know, corridors, this is less now, uh, this was the case uh, in the past, this, in this case, it's, uh, it's less now, but corridors, you know, we think of them as linear, we think of them usually with green, with trees, because green and trees are good, or are natural, and you know, and, and for many, most animals, that, that, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so the Umwelt basically says that the world, uh, the Umwelt is the world as it is perceived by a particular organism, and the, the key point here is that different organisms will have different Umwelt, which is the plural for Umwelt in German. And as many things, I think it's the easy, easiest to explain the term by using internet memes. So you can find many of these online. Uh, this, this is what you see, but this is what your dog sees. So the same object, but different species view it completely differently. It, Umbelt has to do both with the sensory capabilities, but also with you know, motivation. So the motivation, what, what is the motivation of the dog when he looks at the toilet com compared to what is motivation of humans? Uh, same goes for the cat, you know, what, this is what you see, a laptop, this is what your cat sees. Uh, and I, I think this really, uh, really explains the, the concept of Umwelt very well. And it's really, really important in conservation, uh, in, in any, uh, almost any behavior. So if I give some, if I'll give some example of different behaviors where it really matters, mating behavior. Okay, this is really a popular example, uh, was a popular example when the literature on ecological traps and evolutionary traps started to pop, and pop up in the 90s. Okay, so these are beetles mating with uh, an empty beer bottle. This empty brown beer bottle serves as a super stimulus that you know attracts the males more than their own females. And it is hilarious to look at, and it is a nice dinner conversation point, maybe. Um, but if but if you consider it for the for the these beetles, these male beetles, whose you know the, the, their fitness will be zero as the battle you tend to not get impregnated, uh, this can be, have serious consequences on the populations. You know, if all of them are attracted to battles more than to uh, females. Uh, with foraging, you see it a lot. So this is a very popular example. Sea turtles eating a plastic bag, hundreds of them dying each year from uh, eating plastic bags. But if we want to, I mean, how can we stop it if the turtles cannot see the difference between plastic bags and jellyfish. So the way they sense the world, in this case, the way they sense what is considered prey is really crucial in, in, in any successful attempt to stop it. And the same goes, the same principle goes for glass windows and birds. I mean, we want to teach birds to not, you know, to, to, to avoid glass windows, you know, not to uh, collide with them and die. Uh, but if they can't, how can you teach them to avoid something they can't see? So this is why we need to consider the Umwelt. Talking about, uh, or expanding on a different rule, the order of the cues or the timing of the cues matters. And as an example, I'll give something you may have heard of or a system you may have heard of. So you may have heard of this, cane toad, um, and uh, um, wrecking havoc uh, in your uh, neck of the woods. So there's a famous paper uh, from Mick Shine's lab uh, from 2010, where he used condition taste aversion to train northern quolls to not eat cane toads. So basically what they did, they gave to quolls sausages of toad's meat that smells like toad, but with less poison or less uh, uh, in them. So when the quolls eat the toad, they get or they the sausages, they get sick. And then they quickly associate the sickness with the smell of toad. This is called conditioned taste aversion. It's, it's considered a very, very powerful form of conditioning. And indeed, the next time a quoll sees a toad, smells a toad, it should, you know, avoid it. And uh, according to the result, it actually it works. So the daily survival of both uh, males and females increase, increases for those who have been uh, uh, conditioned taste averse or conditioned. So sounds like a very successful, it is a very successful example of CTA, but CTA conditioned taste aversion has been, has been tried in many, many systems and many times failed. One system where it was tried a few times was to teach coyotes and jackals not to hunt sheep. 
So dead sheep were given with a metic uh, substance within them. So the, the cohorts eat the sheep, grow up, get sick, and associate the dead sheep with the, with the cohorts. And again, CTA is very good at doing that. But still, it's been tried at least three times and hadn't, and it never worked. So why is that? So one of the things is, we're talking about the order or the timing of the cues. Think about when does the animal need to do the decision of, of whether to you know, hunt the animal or not. So in terms, in the case of the quoll, when they smell a toad, they need to decide, I want to you know, try to grab it or not. If the smell of toads reminds them of sickness, they will usually choose not to, which is what we want. Think about the uh, coyotes. So when do they decide to hunt? It's when they see live sheep and they decide to you know, run after them and, and hunt them. This is a very different scenario than when they dead, see dead sheep and decide whether to eat them or not. So they might avoid eating the dead sheep once it's dead, but the live sheep doesn't, is, not, it does not, or is not equal a dead sheep. Another thing that may be playing a role here is something called blocking. Okay, so blocking is a learning phenomenon whereby animals will only learn about new stimuli in situations where associations already exist. If the new stimuli provides additional information, I went over it quickly, basically what it says, that it's very hard to undo existing associations. So in the case of the quolls, they never seen a cane toad before. If they have an eaten a cane toad before, they would have been dead. So the public toad naive. Uh, in the case of the, of the coyotes, it's not the case. So once the coyotes know that sheep are tasty, it's very, very hard to, you know, to, to undo this, this knowledge. And it will definitely not work with, with the stimuli that is a little different than the actual living sheep, like a dead sheep. So this is, and, and this you can see it in many, many CTAs attempts uh, in the field. So this is something uh, that we need and we have to consider. The last rule I will expand on here is, uh, I'll give an example to talk about, is be explicit about what you are teaching. Uh, and this has to do with fear conditioning. So fear conditioning has been used a lot to try to repel animals from uh, areas we don't want them to be, areas of conflict usually. And how is it done? You have a CS, conditioned stimulus, which is a neutral stimulus, let's say a tone, some kind of tone. And a US, uh, unconditional stimulus, which is a highly aversive stimulus. So if you take this poor rat or mice, the US, the aversive stimulus is a shock, you shock it. And, and the, the neutral stimulus is the tone. But if the tone and the shock always come together, at some point when you only, uh, um, only sound the tone, the, the, the mice will already expect the pain and will respond uh, as fear. I mean, it, it will be a fear response. So this is called, it's called fear conditioning. Uh, in, with marine mammals, a very popular US aversive stimulus is uh, our uh, acoustic deterring devices. So these are devices that make really, really loud sounds that actually cause pain. In, ma in marine mammals, they can, call, they can actually cause physiological damage, like hearing loss, stress, et cetera. So, and this is why, I mean, when you think about conservation, we don't want to use it too much, but it is good at keeping animals at bay. So this is an exa example from just a couple of years ago uh, from California sea lions, which are cute, as you can see, and they have learned to associate, they're also smart, they've learned to associate fishing boats or boats with fish, and it's really nice when they come and attract to boats if you're a tourist, but less nice when you're a fisherman. And as you would think, it caused human wildlife conflict where the fishermen want the, the sea lions away and the sea lions are protected. And, and what do you do about it? So the attempt was to repel the, uh, uh, the animals from the sea lions from the from fishing boats using fear conditioning, but uh, using ADDs is effective. So, so the, the painful uh, uh, sound, but is also, you know, could cause physiological damage. So the idea was to pair a CS, a benign sound, conditioned stimulus, something that is not painful by itself, with the US, which is, you know, um, the, 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 the damaging sound. When, when they tested that and they only sounded the, the US, it worked perfectly. They reduced surface, the, the lions, reduced surface frequencies, so they stayed underwater more. They surfaces, surfaced further away from the boats and they're, you know, 83, percent reduction in bait foraging, which is great. But again, US alone causes damage to the sea lions, which is something you want to avoid. When they use US and CS, they, they did indeed reduce surface frequency, so they stayed more underwater, but there was no effect at all on the distance of, uh, of, the, of the lions from the boat or on bait foraging. 
And the question, they were very surprised of why it didn't work. And I think, I mean, and the, 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 the title here is a hint that is very, very clear what's going on here. They did a very good job of, of teaching the sea lions to uh, associate the CS with the US. They actually helped them. So they know whenever there's a CS, go to go underwater and, 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 and suffer, less the, 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 uh, have suffer less from the US. What they didn't do in any, any time here is link the boat to, to any aversive stimuli. So boat still means fish. Yes, this sound means, this sound means a, a painful sound, but this association has nothing to do with the boat. So you have to know, and this, this goes, you know, is repeated a lot in conservation. You have to know what you're teaching the animal. You know what you're trying to associate with the unconditioned stimulus if you actually want to, to create a, a response. So this was very briefly um, just going over the, the idea that, you know, understanding animal condition is important. If we want to, and, and we want to in many, many cases to, you know, repel or attract animals to certain habitats, without understanding what causes them to uh, choose some habitats over others, we will probably not succeed. Uh, so we need to have this, you know, rule of, of, of uh, uh, cognition, you know, to think about perception, attention, learning, uh, memory. We need to have that in mind. And the more we'll have it in mind, the better our pro the probability of, uh, of succeeding. And now, uh, a very uh, a sharp turn, and we'll start, I'll talk about Nubian Ibex. And this is work done by a master student in my lab, Yuval Zuckerman, uh, and it's funded by uh, uh, GIF, German-Israeli uh, Collaborations, and the Israeli Nature and Parks Authority. So the Nubian Ibex is a desert ungulate, uh, very pretty one, although it, it, it is a glorified goat, but uh, it's still very pretty. Uh, it lives, it, the populations basically need two main things. They need cliffs. So they, they, they use cliffs for safety. They can climb them very easily and they, they use them for safety. And they need access to water. Um, they are considered vulnerable by the IUCN. Okay, so the global population is estimated to be 2,500. And the distribution is here. So Israel is here and they are distributed through the Arabian Peninsula and in the uh, northern eastern shores of Africa. But the Israel population is about two thirds of the global population. And it's more than that, um, everywhere but Israel's, the populations, when you look at the pop local populations, you either have no current knowledge on the numbers or you know they're decreasing. So the Israel population is really crucial for the survival or, uh, of, of, the, of the species. And in Israel, they are found in the desert. This is the south, south of Israel, most of Israel, which is desert. And they are found both, uh, uh, in uh, in uh, uh, and around the human settlements. So this is a village, this is where my campus is, and this is a, a small town. So you find them both inside and also in, in more natural areas, which as you'll see in a second, creates, I think, a really cool study system. So within the, the settlements, you, uh, they're, they're very high, they, they show very high tolerance to humans. This is in the center of my village. This is in Mitzperamon, in the town. And you can see here, you can, can come in very big numbers within streets. Uh, this is from a few years ago, but this is my son and they're just you know, ignoring him uh, a few meters away. So basically one, one of the main things that is probably happening here is habituation. Habituation is a sort of learning. Okay? It's a non-associative learning, which basically uh, is defined as a reduction in behavioral response to, to a repeated exposure to stimuli that is not due to sensory or motor fatigue. Okay, and one key question in conservation, because we do have, uh, Ibex are not unique, we have many, many species we see in cities, we see in, uh, uh, that uh, come uh, to live along with people who are, you know, show tolerance to, to, to people. And one key question is how does habituation to one stimulus affects behavior toward other stimuli? Uh, it's mainly asked, and there's not a lot of, you know, we don't know uh, from field studies uh, in relation to anti predator behavior. If the animal is uh, habituated to humans, will it affect the way it, resp uh, the way it responds to its own predators? If you take this animal now and, and, you know, and we're trying to, as, as we're trying to prepare to, if you're trying to repel them from the villages or the, or the, or the, or the, or the towns to prevent human wildlife conflict, can they manage out, out there with predators, et cetera, or have they changed their behavior 
too much to not be able to manage. And, and what we have here is a, what I think is a really cool system because we have different IBEX populations. And by the way, the, all paintings of IBEX here are done by Yuval, the master student, one of our many talents. Um, so we have different populations of IBEX who are not connected. There's almost no movement among them, but they experience different uh, levels of exposure to humans. So in the center here, in the, you have those who are within the villages or settlements and they are highly habituated and we know that. Uh, you have those who are populations who are in areas which are frequently hiked. So you have a lot of hikers, sometimes four wheel drives. So they are exposed to humans a lot, but it's very different than you know, being inside a settlement. It's certain type of disturbance, which is lower. And you have Ibexes in areas where you know, there's almost no access to humans and, and they are very uh, pristine and almost don't see humans. All of this, I mean, this is not Australia, this is Israel. All of this within like a radius of a few kilometers of each other. Uh, we are a tiny country. Uh, so it really makes a nice study system and allows us to ask how does exposure to human disturbance impact the IBEX anti predator behavior? So what we did, we, we chose six sites, two uh, highly, highly disturbed sites, that's a, a Midrash Mengoyon, where the, my campus is, and uh, Mitzpah Ramon, town, and Yorkham and uh, uh, Shaviv, which are um, highly uh, areas next to uh, the both water areas next to uh, popular trails, lots of hikers, and Canaan and Saraf, both wadis, uh, dry riverbeds, which are very, uh, almost there's no tourists there, and there's no exposure to humans. So you have high exposure, medium exposure, and low exposure. I'm putting it now in discrete ways. Of course, we, we, we are doing that now, but measure, you can measure various um, um, measurements of you know, quantifying the human disturbance and then put it on a, a, a continuous scale. And our research approach was it approach the IBEX, pun intended, and we approached the IBEX with those different treatments. First of all, as you know, humans coming and approach the IBEX, human with dog, as you see here in the picture, which is a, a, a dog is a predator that is, is associated with humans, and we have predation events of dogs within settlements, usually on, on females or uh, young females or uh, in general, uh, fowl. The young of dogs, of, of goats or ibex, whatever they're called. A leopard model, so leopard is an evolutionary natural predator. They were le leopards in the Negev until a little over a decade ago. That's the estimation. We, we're pretty sure they went extinct, but it's still pretty recent. So they don't really know if you see, but there's a human dressed leopard crawling on all fours, uh, soaked with, with leopard urine from the zoo that is approaching them. Uh, and a novel object, okay, and here just how it, this is how it looks like. This is within the Midrashah. So we have different customs, you know, to, so they won't get habituated, so the novel object changes every time. And you can see here the Ibex um, eventually start, uh, deciding to, to flee. Okay, well, now we have the other measurements were very simple, very pop popular uh, method, but also very simple, which is an attractive thing here. So when you approach an IBEX, at some point it will raise its head and notice you. We call that, we can measure that. It's the alert distance. Note that it's alert distance does not mean detection distance. The IBEX, as many animals probably detected the, the approaching stimuli way before, but this is where the IBEX shows that it's, you know, uh, it stops feeding or doing whatever it's, do it's doing and shows, gives attention to the approaching stimuli. Then as you approach, eventually the IBEX will run away. This will be the flight initiation distance, very popular measurement of uh, anti behavior in animals, in many animals. And you can also measure this, uh, how long the, uh, the IBEX ran. I won't talk about it now, the stop distance. And, and, and we took many other variables you know, uh, that might be uh, related, the distance to the closest ibex, uh, distance to cliff, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We did uh, only approach males, only in summer, only in mornings, all of this to try to, to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the noise, basically. Uh, also in the summer, in the summer, the males are separated from the females and, uh, and young. Uh, so it makes it easier. You find them alone most of the time, uh, reduces the, you know, the, all the uh, um, noise that is added by having the, adding the social context. Uh, so that's why summer is a good, uh, is a good season for that. Uh, okay, so some results. I'll start with what's been done last year, which was just approaching with humans. 
Uh, so uh, this is the, the alert distance for the approach uh, when a human approaches. And we have uh, in meters in the y axis, in the x axis, you have the different site. So Midrash Magon and Mitzvah here are the, the, the high disturbance sites. Uh, these, the, the middle ones, are the intermediate disturbance. And in green, you have the, the low disturbance. And it's really not surprising, you know, uh, in the high disturbance uh, site, the, the, the alert distance is much, much lower. They, they let you get much, much nearer to them before they even lift the, the, their heads and acknowledge you. This is even more substantial with FID, with the flight initiation distance. In fact, Yuval said that, you know, in, in these two sites, a lot of time the FID was, she measured what was her own, because at what distance, you know, 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters, at what distance of approaching a very a large male ibex, will she turn away and run? Because they wouldn't. Um, so you see it, it's more pronounced. And again, there's nothing surprising here. I mean, we know they're highly tolerant to, to people in, in, in the settlements, we know they're less tolerant to people in other places. So this is just confirming what we know. A, a nice thing, although, to, to, to see here already from this information is when you compare the alert distance and the flight initiation distance. So alert in, in, in uh, it's the same result, but alert in, in orange, flight initiation distance in blue. So for the highly disturbed site, it's more or less the same because, you know, they let you get so close to them, so then eventually they, you know, they lift their head and go. Uh, in the low disturbance site also, whenever they see you from usually 100 meters away or more, whenever they see you, they immediately run away. But for the intermediate disturbance, there's a difference. Suddenly there's a significant difference between the alert distance and the flight initiation dist uh, difference, distance because they are uh, tolerant or bitter to humans, but to a degree. So whenever something uh, approaches, they will first be careful, stop what they're doing, you know, notice and, uh, and follow it. If it uh, but they won't, won't run away yet because they know most people just you know, pass there and not, or at least that's in my interpretation, and not come toward them. It's, there's a hiking path there. Uh, if the stimuli continues to, or in this case human, continues to uh, go toward them, they will run away and they will do it in a pretty low distance. Okay, so this was all last season and now we finally have the results uh, of, uh, um, of the, the leopard, the um, the uh, novel object and the, the dog. And this, this was the real question. I mean, how will high tolerance humans, uh, which we know is there, will affect uh, the response to the other stimuli? So I have to, we got this result, we, we, we pulled them together because on, on purpose, Yuval didn't look at them until we almost finished till now. Um, we pulled them together just two days ago. Uh, we're still missing one site, one of the low uh, disturbance sites. Uh, we still need to do some normalization, but just to get a feel, one, one graph. So we have the log FID, uh, flight initiation distance, the different, uh, um, different um, uh, sites where Mitzpah and Midrash Magrion, like before, these are the high highly disturbed and the low disturbed, and we have the four treatments. Well, uh, green is the human. Okay, and you see here two things, which I think is really, is really nice to see. One is that you see an increase, a general increase, in responsiveness, which in, in general, which means that it's not only habituation to humans, it affects when you're going to meet Speramon and Malaysia Ben Gurion, it means that you have a much higher tolerance toward other stimuli like leopards, like novel objects, like uh, uh, dogs. Even dogs, when dogs are, have been known to uh, attack and kill abex around, uh, uh, around human areas. And, and you know, and when you and, and as, as as the exposure to human decreases, the responsiveness increases. This is one thing. The second thing is that, having said that, still look. I mean, in in the in the highly disturbed area, there's a separation between humans and non-human. So they still respond uh, more or respond less to humans. They this still separate between the stimuli. Okay, you see the the there's a significant here. Or, I mean, the statistic, but it looks a significant difference uh, here with the humans, there's less response than the other, but this disappears as you go into the low disturbance area where they basically, any disturbance, humans, dog, leopard, is, is something you should run away from as uh, the minute you notice it. So there is a clear change in behavior here, uh, which might have evolutionary effect. I, I haven't put, actually maybe, I think I have time now, 
So for going summary, it's something we have noticed when uh, it, it, in a different study, and we call it invisible barriers, that when there was a genetic study of different populations in, uh, in the Negev Desert of IOS populations, we found that the largest genetic difference is actually between the two closest populations. There's 50 kilometers here, there's no barrier, physical barrier at all, but still we find differentiation or the strongest differentiation between these populations, and we call it invisible barriers. We think because I mean, they are basically, they are, they are not living in the settlements, they have everything they need here, they stopped moving, and this also differentiates in their behavior themselves from the wild populations outside. So this really ha can have evolutionary, and of course also uh, conservation consequences when you're talking about human wildlife conflict. Uh, and go back to the summary, uh, considering how animals perceive the environment, attend to stimuli, learn from experiences and remember them, can explain conservation failures, and help plan better management schemes. And in the case of the Nubian Ibex, high tolerance toward humans reflect not only habituation to, uh, to the humans, but rather a reduced response to various stimuli. Thank you. And